Dear friends in Christ, I invite you to please join me for prayer as we prepare to hear the Word of God proclaimed. Gracious God in heaven, I thank you just for the joy that we have to join together in your Word this day. I thank you, Lord, for the promises you have given us for your life-giving water of your Holy Spirit and the baptisms that each of us have been baptized into your name. Lord, as we... uh, as we consider your word to us, as we consider your word for our lives, help us to know that you are always with us. Help us to always come to you in all that we need and, all, and giving thanks to you for all that you have given to us. In all, in all things, help us, to, help us to remember our salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Do any of you have, well, maybe that's the wrong question to start off with. I know that all of you have tasks that you really hate doing. Things that you dread, things that you don't look forward to, things that as soon as you know that you have to do them, you start to avoid eye contact with your spouse so that they won't remind you that you haven't done them yet. Do you guys have things like that? I'm sure you do. I know for me, one of those things is, well, cleaning and sorting our home office. And that's what might be called our junk room. See, it's a catch-all. When, when there's boxes that we don't have a place for, they go in the office. When there's papers that we, we're not sure where we want to file yet, they go in the office. When there's things that we just don't know what to do with and, and companies coming over, they go in the office. And it's my job to sort through that. Now, I dread sorting through that because it, as soon as I try to step in the door to get to my bookshelves, which do have books on them, it's like going through an obstacle course stepping over a box here, avoiding a, a wire there. If I want to get to our printer, it's, I better have eaten my Wheaties for breakfast. Oh, good, I'm glad a few of you guys recognize that. Uh, but the truth is, uh, I, do, I dread doing it, honestly. I don't look forward to it. I, I, it's a task that I just, it takes me a lot of gumption, as my mom would say, to, to get ready to do. And I'm sure that you all have those same types of tasks that, that you don't want to do. You just don't look forward to them. You know you have to do them. But... You don't want to. Maybe it's cleaning your house. Maybe for your kids, it might be telling your parents that you didn't get a good grade and that you will need to extra time in school or whatever it might be. We don't look forward to those tasks. Now, do you have that task in your mind? Picture it for just a minute, the task that that it's most hard for you to do. Now, think about the strength that it takes to do that task. The strength that it takes to finally clean or whatever it happens to be for you. Have that in your mind? Well, now you can start to relate to the woman at the well. See, when she went to the well that day, she was not looking forward to that task. She wasn't looking forward. In fact, we know this. It doesn't say exclusively, you know, explicitly in Scripture, oh, she didn't want to go to the well that day. But it's very clear to us that she intentionally chose a different time to go so that she might not be there when everyone else was getting their water. She chose a later time in the day, a day, a time in the day when it would have been hotter outside instead of going in the morning when it was cooler. She was dreading this. Maybe rightfully so. She was dreading this because she knew that as, as she went to the well, people would be staring at her the way they had before. Those stares of judgment. She would look down, and even so much so as we might imagine as the disciples wouldn't notice her when she, well, they walked past her. She didn't want to make eye contact because she didn't want to look into those judgmental stares. She had heard the whispering, the gossip of the others who thought they were better. Is this, which husband is this, third or fourth or fifth? I've heard that she's had seven husbands. We know it. It's so true, isn't it, that people talk. And so you can imagine that every day when she had to go get water, had to go get water, it was a task that she didn't look forward to. It was a task she had to do. She probably dreaded, but she didn't really want to do it. Her family needed water, though. No indoor plumbing, of course. And so they needed for food and for drink and bathing probably at least to a certain degree. Such dread. And then add on top of that the dread of running into someone at the well. Now, it wasn't someone from the city. It was a stranger. And you can imagine as she was looking just down the road, oh, great. You can hear it in their thoughts. Oh, great, there's someone sitting there. Now what are they going to say? What are they going to talk to me about? kind of makes me think about occasionally when I go shopping at Vons. I go to Vons, and I'll be at one end of the aisle, and I'll notice someone, and, I, and we kind of make eye contact at the other end of the aisle, and maybe they haven't been in church in a while. And so I come around 
I come around the, the aisle getting ready to say hi and say how is things going, and they vanished. I can't believe it. I can look left and right, and they're gone. All joking aside here, I, well, that's somewhat serious, but all joking aside, I imagine that's how that woman at the well must have wished things would have gone. That she could have just vanished for that very moment. That she would not have had to face Jesus, not had had to talk to this guy, and on top of that, he's asking her to get him water. We know that she didn't want to be there because she tries to brush him off and say, well, you're a Jew, you hate us, we're Samaritans. Actually, John kind of lowers the language a little bit, but in truth, that was the relationship. It was truly a relationship of hate there. So she tries to get out of it, but Jesus wouldn't let go. Jesus wasn't just going to let her wander off because he knew that she needed to talk to him. He knew that she needed more than anything to hear what he had to say. So one of the reasons I love this story is because when Jesus invites her to talk to him, he doesn't treat her how the rest of the world treated her. He doesn't treat her as the sinner she was and just lambast her and beat her overhead with the Bible and make sure she gets good and, good and scared or good and afraid. No, instead he, he invites her. He invites her to talk to him. He invites her amidst her fears and amidst her pains, amidst her brokenness, to talk to him. He invites us to talk to him. And this is one of the reasons I love it, is because despite the fact I'm a poor, miserable sinner, he invites me to exchange my pain, my hurt, my sin for his forgiveness, his love and compassion. He invites you, sinners, to, bring your, to come to him, to lift up to him your words of pain, suffering. Lift up to him your sins, and he'll exchange those with his love and compassion. His forgiveness. So that's what Jesus does when he invites us to talk to him. Now we use a, the term prayer. And there's something to be said about prayer. I'll, we'll come to that in just a moment. But, but in, in essence, prayer is conversation with God. It's talking to him. It's coming to him, not just when we're in trouble, when we're hurting, when we're in pain, when things aren't going our way, but in all times. It's coming to God and talking to Him as though He's our good friend. John chapter 15, Jesus says, You are my friends. We don't have to come to Him with extravagant words. We don't have to come to Him with prayers that last hours. Not that He minds if you do have prayers that last that long. You don't have to come to Him with this special words or groveling on your knees. He invites you to come to Him as you are. He invites you to come to Him as the sinners that you are. To come to Him. To speak to Him. But to listen to Him. So that's what conversation is. It's not just our words to God, but it's also listening to His Word to us. It's also taking that time to listen to what he, how He speaks to our lives and our hearts. So often, prayer is our last resort. So often, prayer is this, this thing that we come to, well, when I really need help. So often instead we, we turn to other places first. Instead we turn to ourselves. I can do it myself. I don't need help from anyone else. I, I have the strength, the energy, the ability. As my sermon title indicates, some people turn to other places. Thirsty Thursdays, as, as many of you maybe know, refers to alcohol. A lot of people... They turn to alcohol, substance, other substances. They turn to food to try to dull the pains of this life. Some people, they turn to the internet or, or to TV, and they allow their realities to be replaced by fantasies. Where do you turn for your strength? Where do you turn when things are not going your way? Where do you turn when you need help. Jesus invites you that no matter where you are to turn to Him. To turn to Him whether it's been a long road or a short road. To turn to Him and to come to Him to talk. To talk. It's, it seems like it should, it's so simple, but it's something that so many of us avoid doing. 
we build it up in our minds as though it has to be a special place, a special time, and it doesn't have to be before bed or before a meal. God invites us to talk to Him anytime. So, and our prayers don't have to be long. Sometimes our prayers are as short as, Oh Lord, help me. And I hope that your prayers are longer than that because the Lord desires to talk to us. But the beautiful thing is it isn't about the words we use or the length of our prayers. In fact, if we go to 1 John chapter 2, John reminds us that it's not about us at all, but it's about the intercessor who speaks on our behalf. Let me read for you to you from 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is our intercessor. He takes our sinful words and brings them before the Lord in righteousness. And that is why we pray in Jesus' name. That is why we pray through His name. It's not mere words that we cl- to close our prayer with, a convenient ending. But when we say in Jesus' name, we are in, indeed asking God that His will would be done as, as Jesus did His will on earth. When we pray a prayer and ask it to be done in Jesus' name, we are trusting that Jesus will not only hear our prayer, but He will bring it before our Father in heaven. When we pray in Jesus' name, we are assured that our prayer has not fallen on deaf ears. Our prayers, our conversations with God are made holy by Christ. Now this is not to say that at times we can, uh, this is not to say we can't at times sin in our prayers. It might sound a little bit like an oxymoron there. Sin and pray. But in fact, at times, people do lift up prayers that are sinful prayers. Those are the prayers that when we ask that the Lord, and this is a prayer, that He might send a person to hell. Usually people will say this prayer in anger. They will say, God, and I won't say the rest because I really, I I know exactly the truth that it brings. They'll say those words flippantly. But that is a prayer, and that's a sinful prayer in and of itself. Martin Luther, he unpacks this a little bit in the second commandment, and many of you probably remember learning this as as we say, what does it mean to misuse the name of the Lord your God? We shall not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie or deceive by his name. When we say those things, when we pray those things that someone else might be harmed, and I hope that you don't pray this, but there are those who do. Pray for the harm of others. Pray for their pain. That is a sin. Those words are asking that not God's will, but my will be done. Those words are words that need to be turned over to Christ. And not, a, not only in a prayer, but a prayer of repentance. Repenting for our sins. Now as Jesus is our friend, we also remember though, that He is our Lord and He is the one who can forgive our sins. He is the one who can make those words righteous because of His payment for us on the cross. And so when we pray to Him, we address Him as Lord, as Savior. We address Him as Christ, the Anointed One. But it's an address that reminds us also of who He is for us. He is our Savior and our Lord. It is an address that reminds us of the Lord's Prayer, which is so simple, but our Father in heaven who cares for us, our God who cares enough to come to this earth to take our place. That is who we're praying to. And that's why the Lord's Prayer is actually such a good spot for us as Christians to start out. If you don't know what else to pray, the Lord's Prayer that Jesus gives to us is the perfect place to begin because He starts off with our Father. Who else should we pray to but our Father in heaven? And in that prayer, we confess our sins. We also know the forgiveness of our sins. In that prayer, we know that God cares for us not only in our physical lives, but in all our spiritual lives. In that prayer, we trust that all things happen according to God's will and in this world that He is in control. For such a simple prayer, it is packed full of the promise of salvation. And that's a perfect place to start for us. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of pages have been written on prayer. But in truth, it comes down to talking to God. 
and truth that comes down to lifting up our, our greatest hopes, our greatest fears. It comes down to lifting up to Him those times when we are in trouble, those times when we are going through times of joy and thanksgiving. It comes to sharing with Him all the time. Paul says that we are to pray without ceasing. May the words of our lips always be prayers to God. May the prayers of our hearts, all, may, the, may the thoughts in our, in our minds and uh, in our, on our hearts always be lifted up as prayers before God. Prayers that bring honor to Him. Now there are many methods that are out there that are being taught. There are many ways that people say that you should pray. But Jesus says simply to come to Him. Come to Him and share with Him. Come to Him and trust in Him. Trust in Him. You don't often think about prayer as that stepping out in trust. Or maybe you do, and maybe I'm wrong. But whenever we go to the Lord in prayer, it is a step in trust. It's a step out to say, Lord, I know that these things, that I cannot handle them. They're not in control of me. I can't control them. But I give them over to you because you can. And the Lord, He does. And He exchanges the fears, the pains, the losses of our lives with His wellspring of eternal life, with His life-giving water, with His peace and His grace which flows without ceasing. And so may we never, may we never dread our prayers, but always look forward to those times when we can speak to our God and know that He is hearing us and He is answering us. Let us now go to Him in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank You that You not only hear our prayers here on this earth, that You bring them before our Father in Heaven, that You are the One who is our Advocate. You, you speak on our behalf. You, you bring our prayers. And even when we cannot speak them out loud and, and they're only the size of our heart, we know that, that You hear those prayers and bring them to the Father in Heaven. Help us each day to trust in You. Help us each day to, to know that You are in control and that there is nothing outside of Your control. Forgive us for those times when we turn to other weaknesses, promises of the world, things which will pass away. Forgive us and renew us. Renew us by Your Word. Renew us by Your promises. Renew us through our prayers that we may know Your wellspring of eternal life, that it may well up in each one of us, and that we may know Your grace and forgiveness and Your hope, the hope of our resurrection. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.